Hey folks, I'm Grimwit from Natchevil.com and this is Natchean News. I watch and read a lot of Let's Plays other than my own, so here's a suggestion. Don't just watch Let's Plays on YouTube, find some good screenshot ones. I just finished a nice one called Analog, a hate story, played by Professor Prof. It's more text story than game, or even visual novel, but don't hold that against it. The game comes as a series of logs, written from different perspectives on a ship dead in space. You are meant to figure out why all life on the ship disappeared with the help of the local AI, Hyone. As the story unfolds, you'll read about culture clash, family honor at all costs, manipulation, and complete cruelty. If you can afford the game, I would recommend it, but if not, check out the description for a link to this Let's Play. And don't play Hate Plus before the first game. Today's special guest voice was provided by the ever-huggable Goss. She's an expert in Glomp Fu, and she once was a cat, and now is a panda. Without further ado, here's the newest episode of Worlds and Gate. Enjoy! Whirlson Gate, Episode 5, Muse, by Mike Rojas. Special Guest Voice, by Goss. October, 1921, Ravenlove Street, next to City Hall. The only public lending library in Whirlson Gate was old before it was added to the American Library Association in 1881. Despite its age, it was built with beauty in mind and has maintained that image. The outside was made of brownstone, with polished iron grates decorating and containing the bricks of the building. The inside was awe-inspiring, with the ceiling opening to the second-floor shelves. Everything was a beautiful leather brown and dark gold oak, muted only by a film of dust. Unlike the only other repository for books of learning and or forbidden knowledge, the now renamed Vulture Payne Memorial Library was open to all. Library cards were optional, but taking care of the books was not. There was a patchwork leather couch in the corner of the ground floor, serving as reminder of what happens to those that ignore the sacred care of these books. Some of the patches still had tattoos. World senders were also expected to stamp their own books at the counter, as Cora, the librarian, was far too busy reading on the floor ten feet away. Except on that Halloween. Yes, on that fine October holiday, the most fun day of the year in Whirlson Gate, Cora was, for a change, at her desk writing. She did her best to ignore the rumbling and whine downstairs and put quill to paper. The librarian spoke as she wrote, Prick the thumb and give six by six drops into a dry, dirty glass bowl. Mind, the glass must be used previously for soup. The racket and maniacal laughter below disrupted her thoughts. Then, using a quill pen, write the words with the blood. So corrupta. Something exploded, causing Cora to jerk out of her chair. She adjusted her cracked glasses and stomped towards the basement. Before she could pound away on the door, the damn thing burst open. On the other side, a man in a dirty lab smock giggled madly. His face was singed to the point where one could barely tell where his eye sockets were, but his teeth shone a bright white. Cora's mouth twisted in anger. She wanted to yell. She wanted to give this man a piece of her mind. She wanted to slap him harshly, but all that came out was a meek, Mr. Gregerson, you... And nothing more. No need to worry, Miss Cora. I'm fine. I just need a few things from my home before the device can be finished. He gave the librarian a firm pat on the shoulder and darted out the building. The very moment the front door shut, 
the library returned to silence. Nothing but the soft patter of dust settling on the bookshelves could be heard. A handsome man, with no facial features at all, leaned out from an aisle, a book in hand. What an annoying man, he said in a smooth voice. Well, he's gone now. You should continue writing. The man pulled back behind the shelves. Cora's pent-up frustration needed venting, and that man was still here with her. She was usually unable to mutter more than three words to a person at any given moment, but with Alex, things were different. She huffed into the aisle of books, demanding, Why do you let him do those blasted experiments down there? The faceless man wasn't in sight. He didn't even leave footprints in the dusty floor. You can't just up and leave this time, she continued. Why down there? For the past month, I've been unable to hear my own thoughts. Why are you letting him stay here? Not this time, Cora, said Alex on the other side of the bookshelves. Cora could see him through a gap in the books. This was your doing. I'm just here to read. He slapped the book shut with a poof and used it to plug the gap. If you want him gone, just ask him. Cora ground her teeth at the thought. Until then, you should take advantage of the quiet and write. The librarian sat down at her desk, took a deep breath of musty air, and tried to calm down. Alex was infuriatingly right, after all. It was Cora's greatest weakness, her silence, that allowed that man into the basement. He stumbled upon some document or other in the special reading section and began carting all manner of metal objects downstairs. Two weeks ago, he finally stopped to ask permission. The most Cora could utter was, I... I don't think... Then Mr. Gregerson thanked her and continued the work. She stared hard at the papers she was writing. Using a quill pen... She picked up the pen. Write the word. Cora sighed. Why was she like this? Why couldn't she just talk to people? Anything would do. Perhaps she should purchase one of those automobiles like the mayor has and curse out the side window like the mayor does. Write the words. The paper answered. It was Alex's idea she should write. She remembered it wasn't long after she took residence in Wilson to escape the violent decay of her family. Something she'd forgotten had damned her. Soon after arriving, though, she had found peace in the Vulture Pain Memorial Library. Then Alex entered her life. You should do something to express yourself, he told her. If not by speaking, why not write? So she did. Perhaps once every two months, she picked up the quill pen and wrote. So far, there were four books under her pen name, The Penitent, a small pun. Alex also suggested copying and scattering the books all around town, so she did. He was strange, she thought, looking down at her own handwriting once more. Using a quill pen. Write the words. <sighs> he was so strange, but who wasn't in this town? Write the words. He helped her take care of the building. Well, she thought. He took care of the place on his own, mostly. He never left a fingerprint on the books he read, nor took a book from the library, nor, if she thought about it, really left the library. Right, the words with blood. And he was the only person she could actually speak to. She leaned over and finished the sentence. Sui corrupto cum in pia what do you think he's building, Alex? Does it matter? Responded an echo somewhere from the second story. Keep writing. Aren't you curious? Asked Cora. Not really. Write the words, Cora. Use a quill pen. What could make such a racket? It sounds like one of those new automobiles screaming. In a vat of hot butter. Don't let it distract you. I'm sure he'll be away in a month or less. Cora let it ferment in her mind for a bit, then stood up. Just write the words, Alex said. She ignored him and walked to the basement door. What are you doing? The 
basement smelled like smoke and ash, but that was normal. Cora rarely explored the foundations of the building, and when she did, she saw little more than the remains of some long-forgotten fire, or possibly a blood sacrifice. It was difficult to tell in the dark. This time, however, the hallway floor was littered with half-empty beakers of multicolored liquids, fabricated metal structures the size of cats, and papers, none of which belonged to the building. There were also cans of white and blue paint. Cora picked up the pages and read them, not just a habit of any librarian, but a necessary investigation. Half of this doesn't make sense. Looks like it's the technical half, answered Alex, hovering over her shoulder. Look there. Is that diagram supposed to be a dove? Yes. I think this outlines an automatic dove sacrificing machine. Cora shrugged. She'd never seen doves in Whirlson Gate. Just pigeons. And no one bothered them. Not since the Independence Day Massacre of 06. She shuddered and spoke aloud. So many feathers. Cora continued picking up the pages, looking at them, and adding them to her collection. By the 18th page, she was led all the way into one of the back rooms. That's when she dropped all the pages to gawk at the device. What in? It was half-painted, silver, white, and blue, with bits and pieces jumbled together in what could only be described as a train wreck with purpose. Plastic bits and pots and pans stitched together ritual technology according to the diagrams and charts chalked into the burnt, or bloody, walls of the basement. Was that a hand? Were those car pistons? Is that blood-stained rabbit alive? I don't like this place, Cora, said Alex calmly. If he had a face, it would have expressed shock. You should get back to writing. Cora didn't hear him. Her focus was instinctively drawn to the huge electric switch on the side of the device. Have you ever been on top of a building and felt the need to jump, even though you knew you would plummet to your death? Have you ever seen that shiny red button calling for you to push, even though it was the wings eject button of an airplane? Ever want to just kick that bodybuilder in the head to see what would happen? Cora flipped the switch. A whine crescendoed until Cora felt sweat or blood pour from her ears. There was a skull-sized globe on top of the thing, vibrating horribly, and it shoehorned images through Cora's cracked glasses. Turn it off! yelled someone, maybe Alex. Cora did not. She was too enthralled with the new things that bent in front of her. A circus of warbling creatures that scoffed indecently at Euclidean geometry as they danced, glided, laughed, and devoured before her bleeding eyes. She turned to see who was yelling, and then let loose her best scream. Alex was melting upwards and outwards. His missing face grew twenty-one eyes, each foreseeing a new world. The visage of both his hands fell away, revealing dexterous lobster-like claws and his new mandibles, all one thousand of them, chittered in a soothing voice loud enough for her to hear over her screaming. Calm down. I really think we should just calm down and go back to writing. Cora's vision was swallowed by a blissful oblivion of a traditional 1920s fainting spell. like Whirlson Gate or Natchian News, hit like, share, subscribe, or whatever. There's also a link in the doodly-doo if you're kind enough to donate to the cause. Every dollar will bring me closer to hiring Mike Holmes to build my dream house, a cardboard box in the back alley behind a 7-Eleven. Music for this show was unknowingly provided by Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com. You can find a link to his website in the description as well. Today's noun was the Gregerson device. 
Leave a comment suggesting your favorite person, place, or thing from this episode, and I will include it in the next episode, forming a chain of nouns. Have nothing but fun, YouTubes. Have nothing but fun. <laughs>